Um, we're thrilled to introduce Hans Ulrich Obrist, the artistic director of the Serpentine Galleries in conversation with Joseph Grigley, um, an academic artist and professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Today's panel is presented by Cultured Magazine, um, and we're really looking forward to it. So please join us in welcoming our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, introduction. And it's an immense pleasure to uh, be back here in Chicago after last year's conversation, uh, group conversation with uh, the Harry Who, uh, to speak to another legendary artist, uh, Joseph Grigley. So please join me in giving Joseph another very warm welcome. Thank you. But I thought I would think of you with you. Uh, exactly, it's going to be a ping pong. We are also very grateful to Tony Carmen, to Stephanie Cristello, to Emily Fenn, to Amy Kisner, to Amy Fogel, and to Bettina Korek, uh, and to all of you for being here today. Um, the dialogue with Joseph has been uh, a wonderful, very intense dialogue for more than uh, 25 years. We met at the very beginning of uh, the 1990s, and uh, actually, Basically, I thought it would be nice to start by discussing some of the key epiphanies of, uh, of Joseph's uh, work. So maybe we can have the first image here. I also want to say that, uh, as always, it's such a great pleasure to have conversations and record conversations in Chicago because my whole interview project actually was so deeply inspired by Stats Turkle. So I would like to dedicate today's conversation to the memory of uh, one of the world's greatest oral historians ever, Stats Turkle. And I was very lucky, yeah, indeed, a big applause for Stats. I was very lucky to actually get to know him in the uh, early 2000s when I came here to give a uh, lecture at the MCA, invited by Francesco Bonami, and uh, we made a visit in Stats Turkle's home, and um, he basically not only showed me big parts of his archives of many thousand hours, which he had uh, assembled, I think it was almost 10,000 hours, but also gave me many tips how to uh, actually record conversations, <clears throat> a lot of advice, and was very much at the origin of me actually starting to think about that one could make books out of oral history. I had never really ever thought about that before coming to Chicago. I somehow had just recorded all these interviews, had made oral histories, but I never really thought about this idea that not only one could publish these interviews, but one could actually take these conversations as a kind of a point of departure for, for writing books. So I'm you know, very deeply indebted to, to start talking, and of course, also incredibly excited for this very reason that the archive Joseph um, is making on uh, my curatorial work and on my books is here in Chicago. So that will be a second part of the conversation today. We're going to show images and discuss this archive Joseph has been assembling uh, over more than two decades uh, now. And obviously to have this archive in the city of uh, Stats Turkle is somehow perfect. And it was initially actually not in Chicago, it was in Ann Arbor, where Joseph taught uh, before uh, in Ann Arbor. And uh, Joseph always described going to Ann Arbor is almost like going to the dentist. So it was a, an, incredible, an incredible relief when Joseph was appointed here in Chicago, uh, because Chicago is the opposite of the dentist. So we are all very excited to discuss the archive. But before that, I want to go back quickly to the initial images, if we can uh, go back to the conversations. And I wanted to ask That's Joseph good. How, good. Exactly, how it actually all started with you composing these extraordinary works with uh, uh, handwritings. And of course, it has gained a completely other significance even since you started this uh, more than 20 years ago, because obviously at that time it was somehow still the age of the fax, and we used a lot of handwriting. It was before this moment we're living now where there is a certain risk of extinction of handwriting. So I wanted to ask you if you can tell us about the epiphany. When did you have the idea and how you came to this uh, uh, amazing practice of actually making work out of these handwritten little notes? It actually started out only at the pragmatic 
thing. Since I can't hear anything at all, and most people don't know any sign language, so how do I communicate with people? So since I was a little kid, when I became deaf, I was told that, well, we're supposed to be able to learn how to lip read. And I had all these lip reading lessons, which were absolutely futile, wasted time. And so much and so easily misunderstood. For example, when you say to me, vacuum, looks like you're saying, fuck you. <laughs> and it's too many misunderstandings, very embarrassing. So it got to the point I started asking people, please write down what you're saying. I mean, before sometimes they'd say something one, two, three, four times, I'd still misunderstand. So one day after having a dinner with a friend, we had all these notes she had written on all over them. They were on the table, they were on the chair, they were on the floor, they were on the kitchen, they were on the couch. So I gathered them all up, put them in the pile. Then a couple of days later, I put them all out on the floor of my studio. Up to that point, I was making art that looked like art, that smelled like art, that tasted like art. I wanted to do something different. It's never easy for any artist to do something different, to break outside of all the conventions that surround us. We're held by those conventions so tightly. And I put the papers on the floor, and they started saying something to me. They actually weren't writing. They seemed like writing. They used words. But it's more like talking on paper. There was no beginning, there was no end. It was just like we talk every day. But as we talk every day, it disappears. It's ephemeral. So eventually, over time, I decided to try to do something with it. I didn't know what I was doing. It actually began as a form of storytelling <laughs> that had this slightly voyeuristic aspect to it. People were overhearing the conversations. Part of it also began with understanding so many traditions related to what's called the conversation beat. 18th century paintings were, you'd see people grouped together having the conversation, but you didn't know what they were saying. And you'd stop and think about it. So much painting ends up representing sound. Take Candeletto, for example. You see these small groups of people together. You would see dogs in Candeletto's paintings with their head turned to a particular group. And you realize we're seeing sound here. Candeletto's what I like to call a noisy painter. His paintings are very, very loud. And I think that it's, it's something that influenced me in going in the direction of trying to create work where we see sound. And then this one, which you commissioned for the first time back in 2000, white noise. It's basically this full continuum of frequencies of all kinds of conversation, where it's talking, but not really making any sense whatsoever. It's sort of like anything moving through white noise. And of course, you have uh, a gigantic archive of these um, pieces. Uh, it almost you know, connects to what we said about Stats Terkel, who had almost 10,000 hours of oral history. You have thousands and thousands of these sheets, which of course, in a way, also come down to thousands and thousands of hours of conversations, because very often uh, a conversation leads to, you know, a few uh, of those notes. So in a way, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very important amount of time. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about this amazing archive, which of course leads to such pieces like, um, like white noise. For white noise, you then created a special space. I remember when we commissioned this piece from Musée d'Armodin de la Ville de Paris, you from the very beginning wanted it to be an oval gallery. But I was just curious to know a little bit more about the archive on which such pieces are are based, because in a way, uh, you, you've got them in many different colors. You've got these conversations uh, from many different contexts. There are the table talks, there are the fireside chats, there are also, um, you know, all kinds of contexts in which conversation happens, and many, many different ways of then arranging them. So, so I was curious ab to hear about, this, about these archives. It's organized in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's according to color paper, sometimes the shape of the paper, sometimes it's based on who I had the conversation with, sometimes there are topic-based conversations, 
all of these material to organize in small sub-archives, you could say. When I'm working on a piece like this one, I'm working with maybe an archive of eight to 10,000 papers, even though in the end there might be 200, 250 in it. Try to develop different kinds of narrative. Some of it's purely verbal narrative as we move from one paper to the other. How does one comment reflect on the next comment? How does one color reflect on the next color? Kind of like what Joseph Albert said about color theory. You can't put one color beside another color without also changing both. So sometimes it's the narrative that comes into play. Sometimes it's how people wrote on the paper. You could call it the trajectory of the writing. So many things happen. There's so much of a sense of personality in the speech act when people are writing. Something that, I hate to say it, gets lost in the age of email. Are we going to talk about that later? Because I'm very curious um, why you've never made a piece with, with email. But before that, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about these um, monochromous you know, works and then the very colorful works. Because they very often appear in, in, in grids. And uh, I remember um, in our very first conversations, you, you mentioned Albos, but you also mentioned Agnes Martin. And you mentioned a lot of artists who somehow had to try, had somehow tried to get rid of language in their work. And so it seems to be almost like a paradox that you use this minimal grid and then kind of reintroduce language. So I was kind of wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and how it connects to to the grid in the work of Saul Levitt, how he connects to the grid you know, in, 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 in many other artists' work. That goes back to a very influential article Rosalind Cross wrote about minimalism in the grid. She talked about how the grid worked in a way to escape from content, and even more particularly, to escape from the content of language. And you look at Martin's work, and even her statement that's in order, she has this beautiful short statement where basically she tries to evade or evade any specificity of the content of her work. For me, it became an exercise to put language back in the grid. The grid is a beautiful organizing tool. Think of the way Abby Warburg used the grid in organizing art historical relations. So I think that the whole process by which we read rectangles has a particular sense of import that it's to me important both as an interpretative tool but also as an artist that's a structural one. And it's very hard when you're both a writer and an artist trying to resolve this conflict you have between each other or find the way things can move forward together without actually over theorizing your own practice. Oh, it's difficult, that's an artist, resisting your own theory. And in a conversation, uh, one of uh, my favorite interviews with you, uh, an inter a conversation you actually gave to Art Forum magazine, uh, and you were interviewed by Margaret Sandel, you talk about this very interesting conundrum that, of course, at a certain moment throughout the 90s, um, email become much, much more important uh, in, your, in the way you, you have conversations. And you, you actually started email very early on. I was, I was still not on email in the early 90s. I was only around 92, I think. I was introduced to it by, by uh, Gerd Loving and Bruce Sterling. And they, Bruce Sterling was sort of always on email, already through the well.com, and he just couldn't understand why I wasn't on email. And, and it was either Gerd Loving or Bruce Sterling who just sent me to an internet cafe, kind of a very anachronistic idea now, and you know, we all, I opened my first email account. But by that time, you had already been on email for five years. You started really early with BitNet in, in 87. And as much as this whole email thing is important for your conversation, it interestingly somehow never led to to pieces, and you, you say in this interview with Margaret Sandel because of that missing desire. So I was very interested in hearing you now, a few years later, talk about that again, and uh, what's missing with email? 
Let's go back again to the origins of that email, really. Just like the beginning of handwriting the conversations, the email became for me a practical consideration starting 1984, actually. Back at that time, I was at Stanford teaching English literature, learning a little bit about Apple and the old Lisa computer, that's way back. Anyhow, all my colleagues were communicating by phone cards back then. And along came email, and I thought, wow, this is perfect for a deaf person. And all of a sudden, I could send instant messages to people. AOL had instant messenger a little later, which was very, very useful communication medium. So for me, it began as a practical consideration. I guess the question about what's missing goes back to an interview you had with someone else that was very important to me. Your interview with Hans George Gadamer, where Gadamer talked about how writing and printing can possibly represent the emotions of human speech. I love that word he used, the emotions of speech. And you think about it more broadly about the emotions of communication. But some linguists call the super segmentals, intonation, inflection, and how that's very important. And we don't think a lot about, and linguists don't think how handwriting contains those kinds of emotions the way the voice does, since writing is really a representation of speech. I'll let you follow there he does grammatology, where writing is a category of its own, but he focuses on printing. I don't know a really good theoretical study of emotion in handwriting. There are lots of hypothetical New Age philosophy related to that, but a deeper structural analyst, it's not. And I think that's part of who we are, how we write, not what we write, but the how. And we don't have that how the same way when we use an email, unless we start editing our fonts and so on, but it's still not the same thing. The individuality of the void sites and the syntax and something like that. And there is, of course, also something very uh, performative, no, in this. I always thought it was something very performative in this uh, act of handwriting and exchanging notes. And maybe we can have the next image here because that leads us to this very um, strange uh, event which happened in, in Venice 20 years, 19 years ago when we did a, a non-interview at, uh, at the Biennale opening using the stage but not actually having a conversation but just writing each other notes. So we were literally silent as Gadamer said because it was sort of inspired by this interview with Gadamer when he said um, it was very strange because he fell asleep and um, he was 100 years old and I didn't really want to wake him up because I thought it would be inappropriate. And so I just sat there like super scared. And then all of a sudden the telephone rang and he obviously woke up and answered the telephone and was perfectly aware about what had happened. Uh, he said, you know, Gadamer, I'm in an interview. I need to call you back. He hung up the phone and looked at the camera because I was filming him and uh, said you will have the greatest of all difficulties to transcribe my silence. <laughs> and, and that led somehow to this conversation here where we basically exchanged notes and for about an hour and were silent. In the beginning, a kind of a group of people gathered and they, you know, after a little while were very confused because there was no speech uttered. And um, anyway, I wanted to ask you to tell us about this event, but also about the performativity because there are so many aspects, of course, which are sort of also non-conscious in this sort of act of exchanging notes, there are the facial expressions, there is the body language, it's, it's a very performative act. One of my favorite things to do when I'm having a written conversation with someone, it's because we can't really look in the eyes of each other the way people do when they're having the face-to-face -face exchange. I'm looking at their hands all the time. I'm watching them right. That explains early portraits I made of people tense when they're writing. But then, at the very moment while they're writing, there were sometimes parts 
it's no sense of urgency when people are inscribing the conversation. There's a slowness of all parts. People don't pause in spoken conversations the same way. Then finally, just before they hand it to me, we'll look at each other and make that eye contact. And you're looking for some kind of information in that. It's really beautiful. It's different, but it's beautiful in its own way. It's not anything less than spoken conversation. It just looks at the possible way to human beings who will make communication happy. If we didn't write, if we would probably find some other way of making it happen. I'm sure we would. Wiggle our ears. Very beautiful. And of course, these little pieces of paper, maybe we can go back once more to the, to the previous image, to the previous slide. Um, these, because an exchange, as you can see it here, produces these you know, different little pieces of paper which you, which you compose. And I was kind of interested if you can tell us a little bit about these traces and fragments. Because we had a conference actually in the Swiss mountains, EAT, um, not experiment in art and technology, so, but it's not Billy Krüver for once, but it's Engadin Art Talks. And it's wonderful because Beatrix Roof is also here. And it's a project which we co-curated with uh, Philipp Ursprung and, and Daniel Baumann and Beatrix and I for Christina Bechtler. And it's basically conversations in the Engadin, in the Swiss mountains. It's this magical valley, the Engadin, where Nietzsche wrote Zarathustra. Uh, and it's extremely strange because whenever one is in this valley, in the Swiss mountain, one has a many, many ideas. It's probably got to do with the altitude because it's on 2,000 meters altitude. It might also have to do with the strange light because it's a kind of an encounter between the Mediterranean light, which comes from Italy because it's just on the, on the borderline to Italy, and the very, very cold winter, you know, because it, as it's so high, there are glaciers and there is almost permanent snow. So it's, it's very much an oxymoron, no, of south and north and... For whatever reason, it's inspired so many writers, and uh, Alexander Kluge writes there, Habermas writes there, um, and we are, we are doing these conferences there. And so there was Joseph, you, and there was Giorgio Griffa, and many others, you know, discussing notions of, of traces and, and fragments. And uh, Griffa said that every fragment is a trace, but not every trace is a fragment. And, you know, looking at these traces, fragments, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about this. Are these traces, are these fragments, or are they both? Well, by necessity, all these conversations are fragments of larger conversations. So they are, in the same three contextualized at the same time. But you stop and think about that. When we're looking at any sense in which we juxtapose one object with another object, one person with another person. It's a reframing, recontextualization of all of these elements. The traits is the more compelling thing for me because we don't know who the people are who spoke these conversations. And in a way, we don't want to know. The beautiful thing about many conversations is that they always hold something back. Sometimes it's the context. Sometimes it's the specificity of a person or event or occasion. Holding something back gives the imagination of the viewer or reader room to move. Something like what Umberto Acker wrote about the open work. It's open, but it doesn't give you everything you want. And the idea is to make people want more, to hold that back and away from them. Can I talk about traces for you and fragments? Because I think that's a good starting point to turn to Berlin. I want to ask, since in many ways been dealing with so many issues related to archiving the conversations. And our earliest conversations often began dealing with the idea of storing information, whether that information is knowledge or history. Since maybe this was 1997, when we did the first point irony, at that time, 
I actually send me your publication to publication projects because point irony was really compelling for me. It hit me as being a publication, that's an exhibition, an exhibition, that's a publication. And as a literary scholar at that time, I was trying to see how it fit in with the traditional bibliography. Do we list it as a publication? No, as an exhibition, but it's printed and there are thousands of copies. How do we manage that? So I asked Hans to send me all its publication projects. Now, in the mid and late 1990s, that meant once every few months I'd get a small box that had a few really fascinating things in it. And I'd start to archive them, create a bibliography. Then over the years, there were more boxes and more boxes. And then there were bigger boxes and bigger boxes and bigger boxes. We've been maintaining that archive here in Chicago. Right now, it fills over 200 archival boxes. We haven't waited yet. We think it weighs about 3,000 pounds. But this archive has also been supplemented by what's in Berlin. Now, in Berlin, maybe you could tell us a story about this picture and the banana boxes. I think of the whole idea about how an archive occupied space it's a very important one. We have to store an, store an archive somewhere. It just doesn't magically fit under the table or under the chair in the closet. So can you tell us a little bit about the history here? Yeah, so indeed, there is always a, a Grigley box in my office ever since Joseph started to ask me to send you know, all my publications. And so uh, in a way, it's almost like a ritual, no? that whenever I write the text, or there is an article in the magazine, or I publish a book, or, you know, there is a... And obviously publications have always been 50% of my curatorial activity, because I, I believe in this idea of, of, you know, printed matter not being a secondary sort of, you know, product. But when artists, you know, do a book, this is a, you know, an, an, a printed exhibition. And I think uh, he was very inspired, I suppose, by, by Lawrence Wien. I was very inspired by whom I met as a teenager on his boat in, in Amsterdam. And we explained to me that books are works. And uh, I was very inspired by also Christian Boltanski and Annette Messager, whom I met as a teenager in Paris. And they explained to me the same. They showed me their early books from the late 60s, early 70s, and say, you know, these were like mobile portable exhibition. And somehow, you know, I was 17, I met this artist, and that sank in. I sort of thought, you know, one could curate actually printed matter and uh, in a way do exhibitions, of course, which are accompanied by a catalog, but then also do exhibitions where the exhibition is the printed matter and start to think about other circuits of distribution. And I, I mean, that leads somehow to the point d'ironie, because Christian Boltanski and I met Agnes B., the French uh, designer and artist, and Agnes, of course, by then had you know hundreds of stars all over the world and sort of uh, we suddenly thought we could somehow develop such a printed matter by artists on a much bigger scale and print 100, 200,000 copies and it could be distributed not only in her stars but also wherever the artist wants it to be distributed. It could go to art schools, it could go to universities. One could also send uh, all 100 or 200,000 copies to one city, you know, and every person in that city would get it. So they wouldn't have a kind of a homogenized mailing list, but each time it would go to a different kind of circuit uh, of, of distribution where the artist would decide where it would go. And that was the birth of the Point d'Ironie. And uh, Bodansky and I presented the idea to Agnes, and she loved the idea. And she had just read in the Larus um, that there was actually a point in uh, the Larousse, which marked irony. There was the exclamation point, there was the question mark, and there was this irony point. And it was extinct. It was only used for a few decades. So she thought it would be really cute to reactivate this point of irony and call the magazine point of irony because it was a completely you know, disappeared thing. And we ever since, it's been going on for more than 20 years, the most recent issue is actually uh, an issue which um, Raymond Pettibone did with Master Zama, where they collaborated on a, on a layout. We invited Raymond, and he do, decided to do it as a collaborative issue. So we've invited um, from Ete Latnan to, of course, Joseph, you know, generations of artists to come up with a layout, and they design everything. So it really is a mobile, portable exhibition. And then we sent these 200,000 copies uh, to the world. It was, of course, also deeply inspired by my many conversations with Felix Gonzalez Torres, 
Well, Felix always told me that we need to do exhibitions which are like a virus. No, they're like viral. They have a kind of a viral uh, possibility of, of, of infiltration. And in a way, you can see that with the point ironie because they appear in all kinds of contexts where an art exhibition would never go. I mean, the other day, I was in, in Japan and I switched on the TV and there was a very strange film and I didn't understand a single word. You know, I just saw this film unfold and all of a sudden, in the background, there was our point d'ironie of Louis Bourgeois, which somehow decorated the room, uh, the stage set, really, where this film in Japan was shot. At the same time, the other day, I saw photographs where actually someone showed me that the Gabriel Orozco point d'ironie was used to wrap presents. And another friend told me that he saw the Gabriel Orozco point d'ironie you know, with children playing in the street, they used it as a kind of a carpet. So, you know, the way this point d'ironie can be used goes far beyond the idea of it just being archived in a way. But then, of course, as Joseph said, you know, when we archive these things, they start to be, there starts to be a lot of volume all of a sudden because there are many books, there are many things, and I started all of a sudden to have tens of thousands of books and didn't really know where to, what to do with them. And then it was a very lucky situation because the University of Lüneburg asked me to teach uh, a seminar, and so we decided to make it into a seminar, what one could do with these books. And we invited the uh, German artist Hans-Peter Feldmann to actually do a seminar with the students, and he came up with amazing ideas, you know, how to categorize the books. We could sort of categorize the books according to color. So all the yellow, green, blue books could be put together. And then we could categorize them according to weight. So then all of a sudden, all the heavy books were in one part, and then the light books, you know, a bit like what Joseph said. You can sort of, you know, quantify an archive according to, to kilograms. And then there was another seminar where Hans-Peter Feldmann asked the students to categorize the book according to the, the smell, to according to their olfactory dimension, you know, because the books, of course, all smell very differently. So that led to a whole other exhibition. But then the University of Lüneburg actually asked McKinsey to uh, come in because there was a new dean and they wanted to make the university more efficient. And they suddenly, you know, realized that uh, on the top floor there was this archive of my books and they realized that these books occupied a lot of space and basically threw the books out. So the archive was all of a sudden homeless in 2006 overnight and we had to find another place. And so I moved to London, I became co-director of the Serpentine Galleries and, you know, in London you just cannot find space because space apartments are so expensive to rent. So then we thought, like, wow, it would be the best thing to just put them in Berlin, where rent is very cheap, and make it into a kind of an archive project. And that's where then these 40,000 books, letters, all these items went, and that's what Joseph described. So we've got the archive in Chicago, and ever since there is this apartment in Berlin where I don't really live, but where a lot of people have a key and can go and can work. A lot of different things have happened there. Um, architects used it to do a performance. Joseph used it as his Berlin office, you know, to work on the archive. So in a way, but now the problem is that the rents have increased considerably in Berlin. So the archive is kind of homeless again, and we're probably going to move it to Lisbon in the next couple of months, where rent is much, much cheaper. So it's kind of an archive on the move. <laughs> Can we show people some pictures of the Berlin archive? Yeah, so Joseph took a lot of pictures. Said something about lots and lots of books. Okay. <laughs> That's what my first visit when I went to work there. It was late at night. Remember, you had trouble flying in because your plane was delayed several times. When you finally got there, we went up there and got to work together. And I remember at one point, I'm like, Hans, Hans, where are you? And the tag <laughs> popped up. And what was incredible was how you found everything you were looking for back then. I'd say, do you know where this is? Do you know where that is? He knew exactly where the right pile was. We work in the kitchen together. We'd sit down at the table, pull these things together. I had the scanner set up in the sink. There wasn't really much room to move around there. I couldn't even reach the stove. It's... Uh, and the kitchen is over where the banana boxes are on the left. And on the right is or was the bathroom. There's another bathroom, so we were okay there. But the idea of 
or can I chaos come to someone? And then, funny thing about it, though, it's with so many piles, boxes, I'd be going through things. It was an incredible kind of archaeological thing. We actually found some of Hans Ulrich's unrealized projects in the piles. Even more than that, we found his books from when he was a student that had like 100 or 200 post-its and notes in them a kind of marginalia that only someone like Samuel Taylor Coleridge could have appreciated. He loved writing in merchants. And then there's this was fascinating. I found this big box filled with drawings. And I'm like, Hans, what are these? Well, what are they? Can you tell us? Yeah, they're basically uh, all kinds of notes and scores, you know, for exhibitions and doodles. There are lots of exhibition plans, flower plans, and then also some other kind of sketches, many, many lists. And I mean, the thing is also that we're obviously completely at that sort of strange threshold between the analog age and the digital age, because uh, in a way, uh, there are all these different archives, and there is this archive in Berlin which, as Joseph says, you know, occupies so much space and one can barely enter the apartment. And then there is the archive in London, you know, where I've lived the last 10 years, which is mostly digital, which are all the digital, you know, which is basically the digital cassettes of the so far about 3,000 hours of conversation with artists. And then at a certain moment, even the cassettes disappear because then it's just a chip and then even the chip disappears and then it's just all now on the cloud. So in a weird way, it's these two very you know, separate archives. There is an analog archive and there's a digital archive. But I suppose what is also interesting is that all of this somehow leads to my Instagram. Kind of all the roads of these different things Joseph shows us lead to my Instagram. Because in a way, uh, there was always the obsession for post-its, which I already had as a student. I always had thousands you know, of post-its and marked the pages in the book. Etc. Etc. And then, of course, um, through Joseph's work, I started to see the post-its kind of displayed in a in a grid. And I mean, Instagram is nothing else than a grid. Uh, and then it's kind of also really interesting that Joseph mentions Umberto Eco because a few years later I met Umberto Eco, and when we met, he talked about this devastation of the disappearance of handwriting. He said it's almost like extinction, and we obviously have lots of different forms of extinction. There is Pot potential, as Gustav Metzger always says, it's potentially our own extinction and then the extinction of many, many species. I mean, Elizabeth Colbert talks about us being amidst this age of a massive six extinction, but that's not only an extinction of species, but there is also an extinction of many cultural phenomena. I mean, languages, Susan Hiller shows us the languages which disappear. She makes this amazing film where she shows us that every day there is more and more languages are extinct. And then at a certain moment, Umberto Eco telling me that, lang that handwriting might be extinct. And I thought rather than to complain, and Eco wrote a whole essay for The Guardian where he says, you know, we should send kids again to calligraphy courses. And I sort of thought it's probably just not going to happen, uh, but I thought maybe we could actually celebrate handwriting on the internet. And also I met Tony Fadell, and Tony Fadell told me this great story that, you know, he was always uh, in favor of having a stylo with the iPhone, but that really Steve Jobs was incredibly against it. Steve Jobs really was against having you know, a pen, have, having a stylo, and now obviously with the ever-growing iPads getting bigger, etc. You know, the stylo is back, etc., etc. So handwriting is more and more used in the in the digital age. But anyway, to cut the long story short, Umberto Eco telling me about the extinction of handwriting, I suddenly thought it would be really great to use social media to celebrate handwriting and celebrate the fact that none of us, I mean, everybody in this room has a very different handwriting from each other. So I thought to kind of celebrate that by inviting artists and architects and uh, all kinds of practitioners to, to do a handwritten doodle or handwriting would, would be somehow a curated project on Instagram. And it would never have happened without Joseph. Joseph was very much at the origin of all of this. As I would always say, E-S-W, how does it go? E-S-W-J-G, everything started with Joseph Wrigley. Thank you. Thank you. One interesting observation that just came to mind while you were talking, thinking about that analog to digital transition. 
I was talking about writing in Merchants in a way. When you stop and think about it, the Instagram project is also a kind of social merchant. Instagram, Twitter occupy the merchants of social space. They infiltrate it, to use the word you used earlier. And I thought the infiltration concept is a good one, since so many of your projects depended on that. And a couple of, this is the archive that it is here in Chicago now. But think about how your kitchen show in 1991 worked, where you infiltrated your own living space for the exhibition. Or Hotel Carlton Palace, where you infiltrated the hotel as an exhibition venue. Or your Robert Walter Museum, where you infiltrated another hotel. That was an interesting project because the catalog was both a broad sheet and a walk, so to speak. I thought, um, or Boltinsky and the Monastery of St. Gal in the library, another infiltration. But why the Austrian Airlines in the in-flight magazines, another infiltration. My great year to infiltration throughout the museum of the city of Paris. Let me ask you now. In the 90s, so many of your projects involved rethinking the architecture of exhibition space, where an exhibition can take place. What challenges do you see to young curators today trying to develop this kind of thinking in the world we live in now, 25 years after these exhibitions? No, I think that that, in a way, has always existed, that there is this you know, DIY way of just doing it, no? And I think, in a way, um, it, it has existed. And when I started in the early 90s to just do these shows, without any budget and also very often without permission. I mean, the hotel didn't even know that. I did an exhibition there. They just thought, you know, this guy has a lot of visitors <laughs> in, in his room and they thought it's kind of awkward. And, and, but anyway, you know, it just happened. And so it, in a way, you know, without permission to just do it. And I think that has always existed. And I was sort of super inspired, of course, by at that time, by uh, when I started and, and encouraged also by artists of a generation before who had worked for many decades earlier. And Boltanski was always telling me about his exhibitions he did in the 60s in a cinema where he just, you know, all of a sudden did an exhibition. Uh, and he told me about Harald Seman having done this exhibition about his grandfather in an apartment. Uh, and I mean, we can see that also throughout exhibition history. I mean, whenever we look at the book on exhibitions of the 20th century. I mean, if it's the Dada exhibitions, or they, you know, it's just, they just did it. It wasn't kind of um, something which needed a, a permission or an entitlement or, or even a space. And I think this DIY approach, and it's something which fully continues. I mean, it's amazing right now in London that all these, because of the lack of space uh, and because of the incredibly uh, high rents, you know, there are all these exhibition spaces in London right now happening in apartments. It, I think it continues. It's not something which, uh, which has a, a beginning or an end. It has, always, it has always existed, I would say. One of your favorite questions is often asked people about unrealized projects. And I know one of your unrealized projects, and I want to ask you about it a little bit. You once talked about a score, maybe founded on the principles of Black Mountain or something. What was, I had to imagine the curriculum of such a school existing. How do you imagine art education today developing beyond the kind of schools that we offer? Yeah, I suppose, uh, and I'm going to then turn the table and start to ask you questions again, because I'm obviously dying to know about your unrealized project. So that's a very good moment to switch again and having me asking you a question. But I'm going to answer your question before that. Um, the school, I think it has a lot to do with this incredible school, Pontus Sultan, Sarkis, Serge Fauchot, and uh, Daniel Buren did, did in Paris when Hultan founded this institute where 
many of my friends studied, uh, Philippe Pareno, Absalon, many of the artists in the early 90s I worked with in France, you know, went to this school. And it was a school which wasn't bigger than this room, where basically they would just have a telephone and uh, Pontus Sultan and Buren would, at that moment, already globally work. So they would always know who is in town. So whenever an artist would visit Paris, they would ring him or her and would say, would you visit? And, you know, Dominic Gonzalez first told me that Michael Asher it was interesting because this morning we had an amazing conversation, Joseph, in, in your room uh, with, your st with your participants, with the students. And, and Anne Goldstein was there, and she was telling us about her work with the Michael Asher Foundation, which she, uh, which she leads, the, the archive, the Michael Asher archive. And, you know, Dominique Gonzalez first and Philippe Pareno told me that the day, you know, Michael Asher came, and the week after, Klaus Oldenburg was in Paris, and Pontus would ring him and would visit the school. Um, and Philippe Pareno would often tell me about the moment they got Lyotard to come, the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard. And in a way, it was just a very, very simple recipe. There wasn't a big budget, you know, there wasn't any, there wasn't any bureaucracy. It was just a room. There were 20 postgraduate students, uh, and there were, you know, with Buren and, 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 um, and Ponte Sultan, uh, two extremely active curators and artists. And of course, Sark is also super important uh, in that. And then with Serge Faucheroux, they had a historian who sort of you know, brought in art history. So they connected also to history. It wasn't just the contemporary. And they brought in people from all kinds of disciplines. And um, to just give you an example how productive this is, so Lyotard would come in and would tell the students about the uh, uh, Imaterio, the exhibition he curated for the Centre Georges Pompidou, a whole idea where very unexpectedly Pompidou would invite the philosopher to curate the show. And it's a show, early show about the internet which inspired so many, about networks which inspired so many people. And Pareno remembers that Lyotard told him that he wanted to do another exhibition on resistance because obviously the uh, whole idea of Les Imaterio was very much not resistance. It was the super fluid communication age. And Lyotard felt he needed to do the opposite. He needed to talk about resistance, resistances. And he also felt with an exhibition, it was very cumbersome because you kind of do it and it's a lot of work and then it all dispersed. So he wanted to have something which would have a continuous life. So he was actually thinking to curate a film, which we obviously find incredibly fascinating. You know what, how could a group show be a film? And so um, there were very few traces in Lyotard's archive and now, more than 25 years later, you know, we reactivate this project and we, we actually do it as, a, as an exhibition, a very complex exhibition. It probably be one of the first exhibition uh, curated by a dead person, no? because we're basically going to curate this show for Lyotard. And it's a whole collaboration with philosopher, curator Daniel Bionbaum, with the Luma Foundation, and many different participants uh, philosopher Anna Longa, you know, it's a whole team uh, who, who basically uh, tries to somehow curate this Leota exhibition on resistances. So, you know, and that shows what an amazing moment this was, which was created in this school of so many sparks and ideas. So I've always been thinking it would be great to do such a, an institution for the, for the 21st century. But I want to ask you, Joseph, what is, what is your unrealized project? What is a project you always wanted to do which was too big to be realized, too small to be realized, maybe censored, maybe forgotten. And then, as Doris Lessing actually always said, there are these projects which we don't dare to realize. There is a whole category, of course, of self-censorship, you know, the things we don't dare to do. I was kind of interested if you could tell us about some of these, of your unrealized projects, dreams. Of course, I want to say one thing, to go back to what you were saying about the dead curator curating this show. I don't know if I told you this, but this year the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, my department, Visual Critical Studies, just hired a dead visiting curator and critic, Gregory Babcock. <laughs> he is our first post-summit visiting artist. So it can be done. <laughs> well, that's obviously a great opportunity for me to ask you about Gregory Badcock. So before we talk about your unrealized project, I want to hear more about uh, Gregory Badcock, because I've seen this archive now 
you've presented it in the Whitney Biennial, you've presented it recently in London in an exhibition together with Nairi, Gertrude, Bagramian. Uh, and uh, in a way, it's an amazing way of, of revisiting the memory of, of Gregory, of, of his curatorial work, of his critical work, of his work for magazines, for art magazines, of his, uh, of his role as an activist. In a way, it would be great to hear a little bit about how you found this archive, how you actually started to work with it, how you then started to bring it into an exhibition. And I think it's so fascinating because obviously an archive is, is dead as long as it's in boxes, no? And, and it's only when we take it out of the box that, and, and, and we were thinking, I was thinking actually this morning, you know, if it's in an archive, only very few people can have access to it. One needs to make an appointment, um, one needs to kind of then have access to these boxes. And obviously the exhibition is a great opportunity because it's, the exhibition is a mass ritual. So it allows many, many more people to have an access to the archive. And I'm very curious to hear more how you brought this archive of Gregory into the world of exhibition and gave it completely a new life and actually through that gave him a completely new life. Yeah, but it's actually one of my previously unrealized projects for decades. What happened was 1990, in the building that had my studio, there was a moving and storage company that got kicked out, left behind the belongings of a lot of people who hadn't been paying the bills. Gregory Badcock's papers were among those people whose papers were left behind, and Badcock had been murdered in Puerto Rico in 1980. And so, of course, it's hard to pay your storage bills when you're dead. So its papers were abandoned. And one day, going through the storage space, I literally tripped over its papers, picked up a book, and Gregory Badcock, hmm, he edited that, the anthology on minimalism. Hmm, it took a little while to figure out what was there. We picked up all the papers we could, seven or eight boxes. Most of them had sent to the Smithsonian archives for American art. But I kept some of the material, thinking, someday I will write about Babcock. Someday I will do something with this material. It took almost two decades for me to realize that. So for a long time, it was an unfinished project, trying to narrate who Babcock was explain the complexity of his life in the 70s. He developed a genre of criticism called the anti-criticism, the same way Warhol created the anti-film, the same way some artists were arguing for anti-art. He made anti-criticism a genre. He published a lot of underground newspapers, Gay, the New York Review of Sex and Politics, New York Free Press, so from this material, I organized an exhibition, an installation, and a book. But all of it, it's not just an effort to present a disinterested view of the archive, but one that's very specifically narrated. Just like as a curator, you're narrating through the arrangement and selection of artists and projects. That's very, very deliberate. Archives are not arbitrary. They're not disinterested, they're not abstract. When you put them together, you inflect them with the individuality of curatorial impulse. So that was a very important project that at one point, well, two decades, but then realized, now two projects. One simple to explain. We saw a white noise, a big oval room, 30 feet long, 20 feet wide, filled floor to ceiling, with conversations on white paper. The unrealized version, it's called black noise. Conversations are all on colored papers, no white papers in it. One put both beside each other. So that's something on the agenda. But the biggest unreal, not really unrealized, but in process, unrealized project, it's your archive trying to produce from the material that we have some kind of representation of the archive. It's publication, it's exhibition, it's digital representation of the implicated or overlapping nature of all the materials. That is an ongoing process. 
And every day I get another box from you, I feel I'm further and further and further away from the point of arrival. And it's obviously also an interesting you know, phenomenon that uh, at a certain moment one thought that maybe books would disappear in the digital age, but that the exact opposite is the case. Not only do artists more and more books, not only is the artist book more present than ever, not only are there more and more fans than ever, but also we can see that a whole new generation of, of artists reinvents the artist book. And it's really great to see, you know, we started a couple of years ago with Simon Caste, the project 89 plus, artists born in 89 and, and younger, and basically for this generation, again, uh, publishing is, plays an essential role. So it's kind of interesting that uh, there are actually more books. And of course, the Instagram project with uh, the handwriting is only a pretext to do a book. So the idea of the kind of book machine. But I wanted to ask you about another unrealized project, Joseph, which leads us somewhere else, because we talked a lot about books, we talked a lot about archives, but we have not talked yet about fishing. And, and um, it's impossible not to talk about fishing, because it's something which is so important for you. And uh, when we invited you to the experiment marathon at the Serpentine, uh, it was in 2007, in London, it was a project which we co-curated with Olafur Eliasson, and the plan was actually to basically continue the pr marathon from the previous year, which we had done with Rem Kohlhaas. But Olafur said, you know, and it's great that Sally Talent is here because obviously it's a project we did with Sally uh, and Julia Payton Jones. And the, the idea of, um, uh, of the experiment marathon came out of Olafur basically saying, oh, you know, it's enough talking, we have to do things. So he basically said, we should invite everybody to do an experiment. And we invited you to do an experiment. And uh, as far as I understand, this idea to train a monkey to catch a trout is partially realized, but partially still unrealized. So I wanted to ask you to tell us about how to train a monkey to catch a trout, about your passion or obsession for fishing, and how that somehow all connects to art. Well, really had its roots in language. My interest is in, or one of my interests is in interspecies communication. For example, attempts to teach a gorilla like Coco sign language, what was really going on with these experiments. And one thing that struck me was how when Coco was represented in a lot of ads and programs, She's surrounded by a human environment. She had books. She had a pet kitten. So for me, it became a matter of how research anthropomorphizes her to make her appear more human. Well, we really didn't know how to measure her. That's what she was saying with her sign language. So the monkey catching the fish became an experiment in those directions. There was a British outdoorsman and writer in the early 19th century who talked about how some days when you're fishing, it's so easy, even a monkey can catch a fish. And I thought, hmm, I don't know. Can a monkey catch a fish? So part of my research project involved interviewing some professional anglers saying like, okay, Bob, can you tell me, can a monkey catch a trout? And they're like, oh, wow, I don't know. Wait a minute, yeah, 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 of course, of course. So I tried to go in this direction basically to initiate research that was about research. I never actually managed to go fishing with a monkey. Now, when I gave my talk at the Serpentine, I don't know if you remember, but I actually asked the Serpentine if they could get me a monkey. Now, I would think, no, I didn't want to have the monkey there fishing. I wanted the monkey in the audience. I wanted the monkey to be skeptical and ask questions and be critical. But we couldn't get a monkey. The animal rights laws in the UK are very, very strong. So um, I acknowledge that. So that's obviously partially unrealized. But what is not unrealized is your fishing. And, and I'm kind of really interested to hear a little bit more about your, your practice um, uh, of fishing. Because in, in summer, you always disappear for a month. And 
uh, most communication interrupts because you're in a retreat in, in a very remote place. I never really knew where, but in a very remote place. And you read the currents and you read the rivers. And in a way, you once told me that it has a lot to do with art because in a way, you find beauty there. And, and, and you said beauty is difficult and we should never forget that. So I was kind of interested if you can tell us a little bit more about this fishing because I'm so curious to know more because I never understood how it works. I, with your friend Carsten Höller, we once went fishing in, in, in Iceland. It's my only experience ever to go fishing. And we were there for four hours and did not catch one single fish. <laughs> so I'm very curious to hear from you more about it. I think we can rectify that problem of not catching the fish. <laughs> but actually, I'll make two quick observations there. This came up in London talking with the critic, Adrian Searle, who asked some pretty good questions about fishing from the audience. And then I don't know if you know it, that Robert Hughes has a book about fishing. As an art critic, he talked about how fishing taught him to pay attention. The whole idea of that expression, reading water, comes back from when fishermen arrived at a river, you read the water, you read the environment, you read the stream flow, the temperatures, it's a better understanding of what's going on there. It's a matter of bringing, shall we say, patience and observation to the subject. What artists or art critic doesn't do that also? So that's one key thing. The other thing has to do with flights and fly time. I published an article in Cabinet Magazine about 10 years ago that looked at the idea of the fly as a miniature sculpture, or more particularly as a hydrodynamic form. It's not just what it looks like that matters, but how it moves in relation to current. So for me, fly time how they function, how they operate, how they are representations, the way a painting or sculpture can be said to be representations. It's a very important concept. I guess it means we need to kidnap you for a day of fishing so we can go into it a little deeper. Now we're running out of time. I did, however, have one, one last question because I was thinking about fishing and archives and conversations and all the things we talked today about what sort of connects them. And then I suddenly thought it's kind of connected through a word you often use and which actually uh, Bryson used in his text on your work. I read it there first, which is the word of ropography. Uh, I think it's all connected through ropography. And in a way, ropography is, is of course, this possibility of, of, of seeing things which are mundane or which are maybe not significant, um, uh, things which all of a sudden can gain a completely different meaning. It's kind of the opposite of what is maybe apparent greatness and which for this reason is so important. So I was wondering if we maybe could conclude by what is the umbilical cord somehow of all the topics we discussed today, ropography. I can't really add more to that, really. The idea of the ordinary, the everyday, and trying to make it meaningful, it's one thing that artists have been doing so long. Think of Duchamp, think of Warhol, and the Brillo boxes. The ordinary, it's everyday. The beautiful thing about it is that every artist, every writer has such access to their own ordinary experience, and that's everything they need to make the work they need. There could not be a more wonderful conclusion. Joseph, thank you so much. Thank you all very much.